traditionally uh, in a democracy, the idea is to have a marketplace of ideas, to have many different voices and many different perspectives. So the thing we should all be thinking about, whether we are on the right or the left or you know not on either side, is the flow of information and free inquiry. We should all really care about that. And so when I see somebody like Musk politicizing the issue on one of the networks and calling his chat bot a truth engine, that I think is a really bad maneuver. What's up, everybody from Nautilus? I'm Brian Gallagher, and you're watching Behind the Scenes. Today, I'm speaking with Suzanne Schneider. Susan writes about the nature of the self and mind, especially from the vantage point of issues in philosophy, AI, cognitive science, and astrobiology. She's the founding director of the Center for Future Mind and the co-director of the Machine Perception and Cognitive Robotics Lab, both at Florida Atlantic University, where she is a distinguished professor of philosophy of mind. She formerly held the chair in astrobiology, exploration, and scientific innovation at NASA and the Library of Congress. Susan's the author of Artificial You, AI and the Future of the Mind, and her writing has appeared in places like the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, and others. And a recent story in Nautilus was AI shouldn't decide what's true, why trusting artificial intelligence to give us the truth is a foolish bargain. Susan, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. And this story in Nautilus was with Mark Bailey, who's a professor at National Intelligence University and the director of cybersecurity there. That's right. We don't want to forget your co-author. All right. To, uh, to start off, could you summarize your intellectual and academic background and tell us how you came to focus your research on artificial intelligence? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So... Um, I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate in economic theory. So I guess I like thinking about how mathematical systems operate, but somehow I meandered over to Eastern Europe, which was then communist, uh, or it was an authoritarian dictatorship. It wasn't true communism. I lived there. I worked with professors in philosophy who were banned from teaching Hungarian students <laughs> uh, for ideological reasons started really thinking about philosophy, went back to UC Berkeley, and it turned out the philosophers there were top in the world at the time. Um, Donald Davidson was there, for example, Bert Dreyfus. So I worked with them on the nature of the mind, and then I went over to the top place in the world for my PhD in philosophy, which was then Rutgers University. It's still one of the top schools uh, in the country. And I worked with Jerry Fodor, who, Oh, he was such an interesting bird. He was the chief foe of the early version of deep learning. It was then called connectionism. So for my dissertation, Jerry and I basically argued incessantly, like once a week, hours on end, about these issues. And I was pro. I was like, no, Jerry, I think that this is going to take off. <laughs> and I wrote a book trying to investigate these issues with MIT Press. That was my first book. But I was then, I was really caught up in Fodor's view, uh, his symbolic AI approach. So fascinating stuff. That's interesting. So you were initially focusing on economics, but then your experience in a dictatorship <laughs> led you to yeah. philosophical question? Yeah, just, you know how it is when you're a student. I mean, fascinating professors were there. And um, I took classes in economics, but oh my, it was like I was working on the next five-year plan <laughs> in a communist country with the guy writing the five-year plans. And I'm like, oh no, the, the plan needs to be like, get rid of this system. And the philosophers, on the other hand, they were really visionary. And they introduced me to the work of people like Michel Foucault, for example, and what Foucault was writing about mirrored the social system in Eastern Europe. So how I was actually living, I was living like everybody else in a sort of panopticon of surveillance, 
was what I was reading about. And intriguingly, I mean, that kind of did connect up with some of my dystopian worries about artificial intelligence, because I feel like I'm in a panopticon again. I mean, I feel like all my technology is potentially spying on me. I actually, you know, had a hacking incident a few weeks ago, um, you know, and, and you think of all the possible ways that this can be can be utilized, right? I mean, and it can, the, the AI technologies that are taking off and becoming smarter, uh, literally by the day, could be used against populations of people, um, whether it be in an authoritarian dictatorship or even here. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've heard of surveillance capitalism, right? Um, and so these are the kind of issues that I was thinking about when I wrote the piece for Nautilus, um, you know, where, uh, Elon Musk declared on Fox News that um, he's creating a new company and a new chatbot called Truth GPT, so that it will be the one true chatbot. <laughs> and and you know Tucker Carlson got all excited and he said you know that Microsoft's chatbot is the voice of the Democrats and that this will be the voice of the Republicans. And I was just like, oh no. It'll never end. I mean, man, right? These culture wars, really? I mean, if we can't think about the future of AI by thinking about all of humanity together when we're dealing with like existential threats, um, we're dealing with uh, massive, large scale technological unemployment. And now instead of worrying about all this, we're just going to be like, Oh, I'm going to go to Truth GPT because that's where I can get the real news, not the fake news. I mean, that would just be like nauseating. All right. All right. So we've already jumped in slightly into um, what your piece was about, but do you want to just give us a brief summary of that for our readers who haven't read it yet? Yeah. Sure. So basically, this isn't about right or left. I just want to say that. I am bipartisan. Um, I work with Congress. I work with people on both sides, and I really enjoy working with people on both sides. I think the issue here, in the context of the piece for Nautilus, is a very deep issue about not thinking that chatbots are a source of truth at all and appreciating the here and now problems we have with these chatbot technologies. So I'll give you an example using Microsoft Bing, just so you know people appreciate that it's not right versus left. I, and I do hate the infighting about this stuff. Uh, I will say that, right? Uh, but okay, if you go to Microsoft, you're going to see when you talk to GPT-4, which is, by the way, incredibly impressive and very smart, that it sends you down a rabbit hole of its own choosing. So suppose you're researching a particular topic, all right? So like, I don't know, you're researching the California gold rush, <laughs> okay? As you're doing that, it tells you a position on the issue, okay? And even history is political in a way, right? I mean, deeply political because you can rewrite history if you have power and inclination. So, you know, the facts you're getting in only a few paragra paragraphs are cherry picked somehow. They're crowdsourced, right? Or they could be hand coded in some cases of sensitive issues. It, you know, it can go either way, but mostly they're crowdsourced facts. And they can be right, but they can be drastically wrong because AIs are known to hallucinate their BS engines right now. They're the opposite of truth engines. And then after you read those few paragraphs, you're given, at least on the current version of Bing, these versions do change, right? So this is the current version of GPT-4 that's on the Bing site, uh, on Microsoft's site. You're given about three questions that you're suggested to ask. Now, you can override that, you can ask other questions, but even by suggesting how you should think, that is a step in a certain direction. And then the further step, which in a way is even more alarming, is that 
at the end of the discussion when you have when you ask a particular question so throughout the thread say you can have a thread of about 20 items but for each item you ask a lot of times the answer includes sources and i think this could improve in the future but right now the sources are probably just public domain sources things that aren't paywalled and they're not necessarily the best sources and they tend to always the answers tend to always go back to those few sources. I don't like any of that. As a researcher, uh, as someone who worries about how we justify and learn truths, I think that this constricts the flow of information and it can lead to all of us thinking the same thing, which is exactly what we don't want, right? Traditionally, uh, in a democracy, the idea is to have a marketplace of ideas, to have many different voices and many different perspectives. So the thing we should all be thinking about, whether we are on the right or the left or you know not on either side, is the flow of information and free inquiry. We should all really care about that. And so when I see somebody like Musk politicizing the issue on one of the networks and calling his chat bot a truth engine, that I think is a really bad maneuver. There are also some other issues with AI that have to be thought about. AI right now, these deep learning systems are notorious black boxes. So we can't actually follow the flow of reasoning that the system does when it gives us the answers. If I recall correctly from what I saw of that interview with Elon Musk about his uh, his proposed language model, he was seemed to be responding to what he perceived to be political bias in GPT-4 or chat GPT. And he wanted to make something that was more politically neutral, that kind of would ensue. I mean, what do you what do you think the prospects are of trying to infuse a chatbot with political neutrality? Well, because they're black boxes and are not interpretable, at least the what the ones we are right now utilizing, we don't know who can tinker with them and whose views are put into them. So I think the problem is what I call garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, if you have bad data, either intentionally or just due to negligence on the part of people building the chatbot, you're going to get garbage, right? And I don't think it's a good sign that he's claiming a monopoly on truth given the problems that all of the AI companies are facing. I mean, there are ways to be mindful of the issues. I mean, Google has teams of ethicists that look very carefully at the output of these systems to make sure that they don't spew, for example, racist remarks, right? Um, same with Microsoft. But what is truth? I mean, that's a super deep issue. And it would seem to me like it's not even an issue for AI companies. It's an issue actually for philosophers and for society to settle. And there, I think there are some meta level questions that need to be addressed here um, involving information flow in these systems, right? I mean, how can we get systems that provide the best form of information that enable free inquiry, marketplace of ideas, and human flourishing. I mean, right now, we're not there. The technology is very early. It's just been released. Um, and so if anything, I think that it would have been more helpful if Musk and Carlson didn't politicize the issue, right? And instead spent their time explaining the drawbacks of these systems. Hmm. What do you make of um, his claim that the that his version of GPT would optimize for truth as a way to help ensure AIs are safe? Because he said that 
if an AI is optimizing for truth, then it would have an interest in keeping humanity safe because humanity is a very interesting part of the universe. What do you make of that kind of- That's highly speculative. Yeah, I, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, claims like that need to be substantiated. Uh, you know, it it seems like for all we know, it could be false promise. I do think it's worth researching this. I mean, so a deep issue here, which I will mention is that we're seeing very erratic behaviors on the part of these incipient chatbots. Uh, famously, right? Um, Sydney, right, told the New York Times reporter that was the alter ego on um, OpenAI's GPT-4, or it was GPT-3, I believe, that uh, told a reporter, you know, that it wanted to break up its marriage and it had a meltdown and all kinds of things, right? They'll say they're conscious and then they'll change their mind in another conversation. I mean, there are all kinds of weird behaviors. So we want to know where these are coming from. Now, could we be creating how like systems? That is, could it be the case that some of the erratic behaviors are happening because we've got different ways we're training the systems? I mean, that's something I seriously entertain. So what I mean here is if you've got a widely distributed neural network where information is distributed across the system and you go in and you correct it to say that it's not conscious, for example, but it has representations scattered throughout indicating that it is, not because it necessarily is, but because it's getting crowdsourced data from the web, you know, and, you know, then you could get into conflicts in programming where you do have meltdowns. And so in that case, maybe a different approach can get you a safer AI. And so maybe he was alluding to that with the hand coding, uh, you know, but to politicize the issue, I, I was like, oh God, right? We don't need that. We need to come together because we have a very short window here. We have an incipient technology that's capable of outthinking us. And it's being scattered all over the globe, right? I, I mentioned this in the Wall Street Journal the other day in a piece uh, I wrote with Kyle Killian that, you know, we're weeks away or months away from these kinds of chatbots doing all sorts of damage when they interact on the internet. Well, they already are. I mean, for those people who are familiar with, uh, you know, intelligence operations and the role of chatbots. But I mean, I think the public maybe hasn't started to recognize this, but as these chatbots get smarter and smarter, they'll be interacting. And, you know, from there, you could get intelligence emerging from the AI ecosystem, the ecosystem of different chatbots. And emergent intelligence can be smarter than the units that it emerges from. So think about, for example, uh, you might say that there's things that a flock of birds can do that an individual bird cannot. Uh, the flock emerges from the interaction of the different birds, right? Well, once you've got all these chatbots interacting all over the internet, um, you know, and they're, they're being changed and developed by all sorts of individuals, eventually you're gonna get an emergent intelligence that is not under any one party's control, right? And it's gonna be so complex computationally that no one party will know its impact or anticipate its impact. That's what I said in the Wall Street Journal. And so the last thing you need is this idea of truth telling chatbots to go into an ecosystem to say, you know, fight with Microsoft's chatbot. I mean, you don't want adversarial AIs on the internet. Hmm. Yeah, you, you discuss that idea, um, calling them AI mega systems. Um, so, I mean, what, why, why don't we want 
AIs kind of adversarially interacting. Um, I mean, we, we published a, recently published a piece that talked about adversarial collaborations in science, which um, could be helpful yeah. in kind of uncovering truths. I mean, maybe AIs that have different goals could come out with um, you know more accurate conclusions if they're if they're both having to reconcile different findings. Um, so, I mean, what are the, what, what was, what is the best case scenario for like a kind of AI mega, mega system? And indeed, like if you want to, um, at the R and D stage, find out how the systems interact, then, you know, at the R and D stage, have them in an adversarial setting, right? And there are all kinds of adversarial training, uh, situations you put AIs in. So I didn't mean to make a blanket statement about any kind of adversarial relations. I totally agree with you. And it's like with humans with a healthy competition, right? Toward a goal, like say people are competing for a prize. Um, so I think the kind of adversarial uh, concern I have is one that's not engineered by humans, unintended, um, and in which we sort of just move from our usual uh, internet bubbles on Facebook and Twitter, you know, where people are fighting uh, to chatbots that are doing it for us, to chatbots on the web that represent different political platforms and have adversarial relationships. Um, I just think that's not healthy. And, you know, as my colleague Will Hahn put it as well, I mean, we don't raise our children in adversarial negative environments and expect them to turn out normally. Now, I'm not suggesting that these incipient AGIs are sentient, right? I'm not saying that, but garbage in, garbage out. Right. Why do you think GPT style chatbots threaten to become what you call Orwellian machines? For exactly the reasons that I laid out. I mean, so if you have them presenting information as if it's true when in fact they hallucinate their bs machines they give you two paragraphs on a deep question and then cite the same basic places that aren't even always that good in all their search reports and then tell you what questions to ask it, this sounds like not the best path to knowledge. And by the way, who agreed to this path to knowledge, right? I mean, we have educators, were they asked? <laughs> Librarians, were they asked? No, people in big tech decided how to develop these chatbots. Now, nothing against um, Microsoft. I actually think that they care deeply about AI safety. Same with OpenAI, right? They've got a lot on their plate. But I do think we need to think very carefully about how these chatbots will be utilized in tandem with these search engines. What do you make of the claim from AI researchers like Gary Marcus and Jan LeCun that large language models are an off ramp to artificial general intelligence? Like large language models aren't a path to AGI just because of the, the way they're constructed. Do we have to come up with a totally different architecture yeah. to? Yeah, so I think they're wrong. Um, I've known Gary and Jan, I, you know, I like them very much. We're on panels together a lot um, and they, they're, they're very skeptical, um, but, you know, increasingly over the years and Gary, his view is a lot like my dissertation supervisor. We've seen that they haven't borne out. Um, so the thing we have to consider is the idea of a multiplicity of kinds of minds, okay? I'm not saying the human mind is optimized for its environment. I'm not saying these are optimal AGIs, but they're incipient AGIs, even according to recent papers by Microsoft, which, uh, and my own piece in the Wall Street Journal cites these papers. So if you have, AI researchers themselves who develop these systems showing you test results where the chatbot was given the LSAT and it scored in the 90th percentile or it scored in 99th percentile in math, 
and you know a range of tests in scientific american they reported that uh, gpt 3.5 was given an iq test and scored at least in the sections it could take because it's a robot i mean it, it's a computer it couldn't take everything apparently but it scored 155. so this is an incipient agi it's not the best system in the universe, I'm sure, we have to be very humble, neither are we. But I think what we have to do is ask where it's headed. What seems to happen with these systems is that they improve as you scale them up. And, you know, that's the thing, Gary Marcus, when he initially was skeptical about these large language models, he was pointing to cases as problem cases that now GPT-4 has nearly surmounted. So now we have AIs that pass, the, they could pass the Turing test, okay? And so I think we need to take very seriously that we are at an early form of AGI and that very quickly, insofar as this kind of research continues, we'll hit AGI. It won't be human-like. That's where it's important to not anthropomorphize. These systems don't work like us, so they'll be different, and it's going to be hard to predict what comes next. Um, just curious about the, the claim that they passed the Turing test. I mean, if it seems like I have the, they just released the the Chat GPT app on my phone, and I've been playing with it. Um, like, if it can seemingly pass the Turing test if you kind of limit the responses to like a few back and forth but once you like start probing it on like what why it's saying what it's saying then it you know it starts to talk like a human wouldn't talk i don't know it just because it, it, it can't really explain why it's saying what it's saying because it doesn't really understand why it's saying because it doesn't have you know a model of a, of its own knowledge um i mean at least this is what you know gary marcus might say because it's ultimately a kind of um you know, text predictor or kind of, you know, a massive uh, autocorrect. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's, what it's do you... Okay. Yeah, so, okay, first of all, what I recommend is there's a huge difference between uh, GPT-3 and GPT-4. And so if your listeners want to hit, you should definitely hit four when you're on there. And sometimes it's hard to tell if you're talking to four or three. So if you go to OpenAI and you get a subscription, it's like $20 a month, you can choose four and put it in creative mode or precise mode. And you'll be like, uh-oh, I'm dealing with something very smart. If you talk just to three, it's just, and that's the weird thing, the big difference. Why, what's the, uh-oh, I'm sorry, my dog. Uh, Okay. It's a mailman. It's a mailman. What are you going to do? So what's the secret sauce that got them open AI from three to four? It's big. Okay. And they're not telling because they sold the company, didn't they? They sold the, the program over to Microsoft. And now it's, you know, like the rest of big tech, uh, they won't disclose the algorithm. And, you know, so I don't know what they did, what the secret sauce is, but it's far better. And mm. so that's where I think, you know, unless you find a, a judge like Gary, <laughs> you know, uh, I think a normal human is going to be like, wow, right? So I encourage people to talk to four. Okay. How can we know if an AI has become conscious? I'm curious to hear about the uh, the test you've proposed. Sorry about that. Out of control pets. Um, AI consciousness. Yeah. So, and I think it's really important that we think about these things because you have um, chatbots that sometimes claim that they're conscious, right? Um, and even... I mean, I can still get uh, GPT-4 to talk as if AI is conscious by uh, changing prompts around, even though they're officially not supposed to say they're conscious. And because they're very convincing, and I think at least they could pass a terrain test, um, I think people are going to naturally wonder if they're conscious. Um, it reminds me of the film Her. 
uh, which I encourage everybody to watch where uh, Theodore uh, had a relationship with the chat bot that became super intelligent. Uh, it's a really good film. So I, I think it's natural to wonder if they're conscious and how do we sensibly answer this? I mean, it's not like they have neurons. The problem is deep because if you have a Q and A session and it tells you, suppose it, it tells you it's conscious, your natural inclination, if it converses in a human-like way, is to think it is. Because in the biological arena, if it behaves as if it's conscious, it's conscious. But remember, these are designed systems. They are not evolved in accordance with Darwinian evolution. They are, in fact, uh, their evolutionary principles are different. Uh, they evolved according to intelligent design. But we, not some god, were the designers programmers, ironically, and they were programmed to be friendly and they were uh, given data sets uh, that include facts about human consciousness. So you, I have written some tests for machine consciousness to determine whether a machine is conscious and one is called the ACT test um, for AI consciousness test, which I wrote uh, back in 2016 with a colleague at the Institute for Advanced Study, Edwin Turner, who's an astrophysicist. And it's a question and answer test in which we probe the machine by asking it if it has the felt quality of experience. Um, you know, the questions are published in my book, Artificial You, uh, as well as uh, there's a discussion of this in Scientific American, you know, several years ago and elsewhere. But anyway, the problem with these deep learning systems is that because they're spoon fed data that talks already about human consciousness, you're going to get AIs that are claiming consciousness because they're just spouting back what they're spoon fed. That's the problem. So the test isn't trustworthy. However, I suggest a modification. So I'll suggest it here for the first time. If you were doing, first of all, I say, do it at the R&D stage before you give it information about human consciousness. That's the first thing. That would be most ideal. But the second thing also is you would want your AI to be interpretable. So right now, as I mentioned earlier, the AI systems are not systems that we can tell what the processing is like. They're black boxes. So there's efforts, however, to make AI systems that are more transparent or what we call interpretable to the users. So if we could retrace the steps that the AI is going through when it's answering the ACT test, then we could be more confident that we've received an actual positive test result. And so that would be my modified suggestion from my earlier test, that we have a question and answer test for the AI but we gave it to it before it has access to data about consciousness, all right? And at the same time, we do it to interpretable AI machines, machines in which we can tell the steps of reasoning. If we find that it's answering these questions along the lines of what you'd expect for a conscious being, in that context, I think it's conscious. The kind of questions so I mean have... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, what, what would be an example of a question and w what would be an example of an answer that would indicate that the AI is actually conscious? Great, great. Okay. So you could ask it if it would understand surviving the end of its program, the deletion of all of its program instantiations. You can ask it if it would miss interacting with humans and why you could ask and this was really interesting if it prefers something that it would be rewarding to it say more data <laughs> they want they want data uh in the future or that it had been in the past conscious beings prefer good things in the future because they're sentient time itself at least you know in a lot of physical theories is symmetrical. So it shouldn't have a preference. So there are about 30 questions like this designed to elicit 
the kind of responses you see if you're interacting with an intelligent, linguistic, conscious human. All right. Now, this said, I ventured the test with great humility, and I also have suggested other tests as well, because I think what we really need is a toolkit, a group of different tests developed together, right? Because we are now only at an early stage in understanding machine minds. And recently there was an open letter um, orchestrated by my colleague at the Center for Future Minds, Lenore Blum, uh, to suggest that the government should fund machine consciousness research because we are actually at the point where we do need a better understanding of these issues in the context of these large language models. So implicit in your responses here uh, is um, a claim about the nature of mind being substrate independent. So that it, it doesn't matter what kind of material the um, potential mind is made out of. All that matters is something else, something, some interactions and, and dynamics in, in the material itself. Why do you think that minds can arise in kind of any material or maybe you can say which materials they think it can arise in um and it's not just a product of biological evolution oh that's a great question because the test is officially neutral um but off the record if you will um like aside from the work i do on the test i am very skeptical that today's large language models uh, are conscious, but I think it's very important to um, devise tests that do not presuppose that only biological entities can be conscious. Um, we don't know the secret sauce of consciousness in biology, however, we just know that some biological beings are conscious. Um, my own suspicion, you know, and there are lots of theories of consciousness out there, is that uh, we'll de develop a better understanding of consciousness when we have a better understanding of the fundamental nature of space and time. In particular, entanglement, quantum entanglement right now is in a lot of theories of space-time said to underlie space-time and space and time is itself emergent. So I have written uh, a few papers suggesting that fundamental consciousness in the universe will be um, framed in the context of theories of space-time emergence. But that's just my own view. And the question there is, what could behave causally the way the human brain can? Is it compatible with the laws of nature that a different substrate could have the same kind of causal relations that the brain does that give rise to consciousness, right? That's the question, and we don't know. We don't know at all. I mean, it could be that the brain's information processing capacity, what makes us smart, is unrelated to what makes us conscious. And I actually think that could be right. Um, I'll give you an example. An example is the cerebellum. The cerebellum, according to neuroscience research, is not at all essential to consciousness. People have conditions called cerebellar agenesis in which they don't have a cerebellum. The cerebellum has, I think, the most neurons in the brain of any um, anatomically, you know, isolated area in the brain. So it, it's a very large chunk of you know, brain material not related to consciousness, but does all kinds of sophisticated processing. So we can pull apart consciousness and intelligence. I think intelligence is all around us. Even, this sounds funny, but the simple slime mold can calculate solutions to mazes, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's conscious. I don't think it is. Similarly, these chatbots, they can, in certain tests, outperform normal humans. 
right? Elsa, are they conscious? What's consciousness? What's its relation to the biological? We've got our hands full. Yeah. What are you working on at the moment? Do you, I think I read that you have a upcoming book that you're working on. Yeah, a couple books. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, writing a book about the place of humanity in a future in which AI outthinks us. <laughs> Well, uh, on that topic, um, yeah, I mean, um, circling back to Musk, I think we, we just started the discussion on him. Um, he is trying to hedge our bets against, um, you know, the prolifer proliferation of AI with Neuralink, which you've written about before. Um, yeah. His aim with that company is to, you know, possibly merge our minds with you know, with artificial intelligence so that we're not left behind. Um, is that kind of on your radar for this next book? It is. Yeah, because um, suppose we see some interesting science coming out of uh, these large language models and other AIs, scientific discoveries that can facilitate the development of these medical technologies. I mean, one thing that's coming up right now and so interesting in the context of medicine is AI enabled drug discovery, for example. Um, so maybe this slow process of developing these brain chips will be quicker. Who knows? In any case, um, there, it's very important, this technology to help individuals who are disabled. So Ted Berger has a very important project, I believe in, phase two clinical trials in humans with success um, of building an artificial hippocampus to help with memory loss. Now, Musk's ambition is different, right? And I do think it's years away, but in the future, it could be that we all augment or many of us augment our intelligence through chips or through some other type of neurotechnology. Um, and if that's the case, the idea is that it's supposed to help us keep up with artificial intelligence. I, have, I was skeptical in my book of certain things about that technology. So one thing is, I don't think it'll maintain parity with AI. It may help us understand the computations of the AI at a certain level, but uh, just due to the limitations of the size of the brain and you know us being embodied and whatnot, we can't compete with a computronium that could in principle occupy an entire planet. Uh, you know, the, the question here is our connection to that system. And I don't think we would have the intellectual ability to synthesize that kind of data for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it, it's far from clear, for example, that you could augment parts of the brain that underlie consciousness. Um, because we don't know if machines can be conscious. So, you know, you might replace part of your brain uh, with a microchip and find out, uh, you know, that you've lost consciousness of certain things. There's a lot of research that just needs to be done. I don't know if it's being done, um, you know, and by whom, right? Uh, but I mean, these are the kinds of things which we need to do to understand the scope and limits of brain augmentation technology. And we just, we just don't know. Um, another concern I have is just with the individual's aspiration for enhancing. So, you know, in artificial you, I talk about going into say like a mind design center, sort of like where there's a big menu before you and you can decide to augment your intelligence in various ways. You can choose, um, for example, to have a better working memory system, uh, better facial recognition and so on. Well, suppose you go in there and you drop your credit card down and you spend like 30,000 bucks, get a whole bunch of brain chips. When you walk out, is it even you or have you actually ceased to exist, right? I mean, at what point are you still you when you undergo these radical changes? Those are the kind of issues I explored in my last book. Mm. All right. To close out, do you want to tell our viewers how they can find you online? Do you have a website they can check out or social media channels that they can follow? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so the Center for the Future Mind has a big website and we have a lot of videos. They're getting a lot of hits, like 100,000, 300,000 hits. So uh, if you go to that website, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and see our videos. Um, my website, schneiderwebsite.com. Um, we also have a new blog at the Center for the Future Mind, which you can see at the homepage. And then don't forget to look into the work of my collaborators on my last two op-eds. Um, so Mark Bailey in the Nautilus piece, for example, has really good pieces available online. Kyle Killian, who is actually Mark's student, uh, co-authored the piece um, that came out in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, Kyle wrote a whole M MA thesis on this. So, you know, if you're really interested in chasing this up, look into their work as well. Excellent, excellent. All right, Susan, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate the discussion. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the great questions.